Hi everybody, welcome to Extract 2. This is a revision presentation for the OCR 585 exam, June 2016. And uh, hopefully you get some useful economics from this because we're going to focus in this session on the economics of the balance of payments and in particular balance of payments imbalances. The extract is really clear and it's important to focus on some of the phrases here. I'll put them in bold red for you. Uh, globalization has increased the volume of world trade. We know that, although actually the growth of world trade has slowed down in recent times. But what we've also seen happen is an increase in trade imbalances. There's a growing divide between surplus countries and deficit countries in the world economy. And this is uh, one of the factors that's caused the, the rise, the growth of protectionist sentiment in many different parts of the world. Extract 2 has a very clear steer, very clear focus on the nature of the Chinese-US trade relationship and in particular the way in which exchange rate changes can change, can affect the overall trade balance between two countries. It's that that I'm really going really to focus on in this session and I hope you'll find this, this uh, useful in terms of a revision. Uh, what we've seen uh, happen, of course, is that uh, between 2007 and 2013, there were quite big swings in the overall current account deficits for the United States and also changes in their exchange rates. We're told, however, that changes in the effective exchange rate, which we'll come to in a second, by the way, did not always have the expected impact on the UK's current account. I'm not a question spotter. I'm not trying to sell you something here, but there's a very clear steer in this extract that they might well ask you to analyze and evaluate why a change in a nation's currency doesn't always bring about a significant, substantial change in trade balances. And that's going to again be the focus of our, of our, of our revision session in the next 15 or 20 minutes. So let's go first of all to figure 2.1 which shows the current account balances for China up in the top there. I very helpfully put a little map flag to show you and the United States down at the bottom. Okay, so what are the key things to take away from, uh, from this chart? First of all, that we're measuring trade here, the trade balance, X minus M, in billions of US dollars, standardized measure. And you can see, hopefully fairly clearly, that China runs a current account surplus every year which peaked in 2008 at just over $400 billion, but has subsequently fallen. Whereas the United States is running a uh, current account deficit, uh, which uh, peaked at the start of the period, at about $700 billion, fell very sharply in 2009, largely as a result of the recession, to just under 400 billion. And since then, by and large, the USA has run uh, a current account deficit of around 400 to 450 billion dollars each year up to 2013. So what's this essentially saying to you? It's saying that there's a big trade imbalance between these two giant economies. Uh, China on the one hand has a structural trade surplus, the United States on the other has a structural trade deficit. Now, one way of uh, measuring it is as shown in figure 2.1 in terms of billions of dollars. I just want to alert you to the fact that there's another way of showing uh, the trade balance, and that is to measure it as a share of the nation's economy, uh, as a share of percentage of GDP. So what I've done in this chart is simply use exactly the same data, um, updating to 2014, but I'm expressing the Chinese current account surplus as a share of Chinese GDP. You can see again, it peaked in 2007 at about 10% of their national output. Since then, it's fallen very sharply. So China is now running a current account surplus of about 2% of our economy. That's you know a fifth of what it was seven or eight years ago. That is a substantial realignment of the Chinese current account. The surplus, although it's huge in dollar terms, um, is not as big as a share of their, of their economy. And pretty obvious reason why not, because China's been growing an average of 9% each year. The denominator, the GDP has been growing very quickly. What about the United States? 
we'll go back to 2004, they were running a current account deficit of about 5% of GDP. If you follow the blue line, that uh, worsened in 2006, then improved quite sharply through to 2009. And since then, actually, the American current account deficit has improved. It's been about two, two and a bit percent of their GDP. So the key takeaway point I think here is that there are still those big trade imbalances. The USA still runs a large, significant current account deficit, but the trade surplus that China enjoys is much smaller than it was before. Now back to uh, the extract, um, extract two. The second chart you have shows the exchange rate for the United States for the US dollar. Now this, this chart's interesting and important because it shows the effective exchange rate index. So it, it's not the dollar against the yuan, it's not the US dollar against the pound or against the euro or against the Japanese yen. What this chart is showing is the overall trade weighted value of the US dollar against a basket of currencies. And that basket is weighted according to the percentage of trade that the United States does with different countries. So it's heavily weighted, for example, towards Canada, and Mexico, uh, to the European Union, and yes, towards countries such as Japan and, and China. So the chart is showing the exchange rate index for the dollar. It's expressed as an index number, and 2010 is the base year for the index. You can tell that because the index number and the value of 100. Now, what, what is happening here? What does it suggest? Uh, it suggests that the dollar has fallen. Okay, so the US dollar has fallen as a share of uh, the US dollar has fallen as a share of uh, as, a, as, a, as a currency. Okay, there has been some depreciation there. But the extent of the changes isn't particularly great. We'll come back to that point in a second. Let's go first of all from 2009 through to 2011. And we found we find that the dollar fell in value, fell from 104 to 95. You can do the maths. That's a depreciation fall in the dollar of 8.65%. So that's not an insubstantial depreciation. It's just under 10%. Actually, when we find, if we go back to figure 2.1, we can find that the US current account deficit actually got worse over this period. So a fall in the US dollar, actually at the same time, the current account balance worsened. That suggests that more than strongly hints at a kind of J-curve effect, and we'll come back to that in, in a few seconds. So the dollar fell from 2009 to 2011. And then for the final two years of extracts, uh, figure 2.2, the dollar starts to appreciate once again. The US dollar on a trade weighted basis goes from 95 to 98 to 99. That's an appreciation of 4%. So there's been some volatility in the dollar um, over the, the seven years shown by the, by the figure, but it's not significant in terms of very volatile currencies. The dollar has been reasonably stable over this period. If anything, it's depreciated, but not by a huge amount. If we just add a little bit to what's happened since the extract came out, we find that the dollar has been appreciating quite sharply. I'll just go back to figure 2.2 to help us here. We can see that in 2012 and 2013, the US dollar did start to appreciate again. Not against every currency, but overall and from 2013 onwards flat line for a year or so but look what's happened since the end of 2014 into 2015 and into the, the first uh, three or four months of this year the dollar has appreciated quite sharply there's been what i think is a significant dollar appreciation part of that is the fact that janet yellen at the fed started to raise interest rates but crucially, one of the issues is the slowing down of the US economy and also the devaluation of the Chinese yuan, which started in the summer of 2015. So the dollar is clearly now appreciating as a currency. And that has consequences, not just the American economy, but also for other countries, including uh, the likes of China and also Zambia, which figures on the case study. 
just want to pause here and think a little bit about what's happened to the the dollar yuan exchange rate. Uh, China is such a big country, they have two names for their currency, the renminbi and the yuan. I'll just use the yuan in this presentation. So what this chart shows is the value of the yuan against the US dollar. And when it's falling, the yuan is appreciating. In other words, if we go up to 2006, it took just over eight yuan to buy a dollar. By the time it gets to 2008, you, could only, you only had to give up six and a half, nearly seven yuan to buy a dollar. So when this chart is falling, the yuan is appreciating against, against the US dollar. China basically came off their dollar peg in 2005. They then allowed the exchange rate to fall gradually until 2008. And then the world economy went into the tailspin, the global financial crisis. And for essentially for two years, China decided to reimpose a fixed exchange rate against the dollar. They have the central bank able to manage the exchange rate and limit the, the daily changes. And then from 2010 onwards, uh, China relaxed its dollar peg and effectively allowed the yuan to appreciate again uh, against the dollar. But as you can see, it's a pretty slow, gentle, shallow appreciation. Overall, uh, there's been a quite a large appreciation of the yuan, but it's been it's taken a number of years to uh, to happen. And just if you note at the bottom right hand corner of this chart, we see the decision by China to devalue the yuan in the summer of 2015, and they've subsequently allowed the yuan to depreciate still further. So what's the take home point from this chart? I think is that you know, the trade imbalances between China and the States, if we lived in a world of fully floating exchange rates, then it's likely, Keteris Parvis, it's likely that the Chinese currency would have appreciated to a greater extent against the US dollar. But of course, China manages its currency. and It's not prepared to allow uh, the dollar to depreciate uh, as quickly as perhaps others might have wanted it to do. Part of extract two will be, in all likelihood, a chance for you to analyze the effect of exchange rate changes on the trade balance. This flowchart just takes you through the idea of the connectives approach. So the essence of the extract is that the dollar has depreciated, uh, it buys fewer yen and euros and, and yuan than it did before. So starting in the top left, if the dollar depreciates, that means it buys less of other currencies. In theory, that means that US goods are uh, cheaper priced in foreign currencies but also the imports coming into the United States are more expensive priced in dollars. The overall effect should be that the demand for US exports should increase, should be expansion of export sales, that there should be a contraction in demand for imports coming into the States, including from China. In theory, depending on the elasticities of demand and supply, that exchange rate change then causes the value of exports to go up and the value of US imports to fall. X rises, M falls, the trade balance is the difference between the value of exports and imports. So in theory, we start top left, a depreciation of the dollar in theory should lead to a fall in the size of the US trade deficit. Folks, that's the theory, okay? Not necessarily the reality. So how do you evaluate this? I think this is really key to understanding types of questions that are likely to appear in extract two, though who knows. In theory, a currency depreciation, for example, of the dollar, is an expansionary policy for the United States, because it should, in principle, expand their trade sector, help to improve the trade balance, and be a stimulus to, to demand and growth. But this depends on, and this is an evaluative phrase that you can always use to score strong marks. It clearly depends on time lags. It, it's going to take a while for uh, consumers and businesses to notice and then respond to the change in the price of exports and imports. So time lags will be important. It depends on the scale of the exchange rate change. And I think figure 2.2 suggests that the scale of the dollar depreciation has been, has been fairly modest. It depends on whether the exchange rate change is, is temporary or seen as a, as a permanent shift. And crucially, 
it depends on the actual response of businesses and consumers if the prices of goods and services change. So this is where you bring in the important concepts of price elasticity of demand for exports and imports, and also price elasticity of supply for the export businesses that hopefully will benefit from having a more competitive exchange rate. It also depends on the impact of the initial change in exports. Are there multiplier and accelerator effects which could, could uh, boost the level of GDP growth and employment? And, and point six, I think, is a really important evaluation uh, point. The effect of a depreciation of a currency really does depend on when the currency change actually happens. In particular, does it happen when you're coming out of a recession, when there's plenty of spare capacity which you can take use of? And does it happen when your trade partner economies are also recovering, in which case they're perhaps more likely to want to buy more of your products? So the timing of an exchange rate change can be as important as the scale of an exchange rate change. And I think that's a useful evaluation point to bear in mind. Okay, so now we come to a possible analysis diagram. Uh, we're hinting that in extract two, we're told that the change in the, ex the American balance of payments on current account was not as big as might have been expected given the exchange rate change. Well, what they're really hinting at here is the idea of the J curve. And the J curve is essentially a, an idea which says that if you have a, a depreciation of the currency, under a floating exchange rate, or if you have a devaluation of a currency in a fixed exchange rate, the effect on the trade balance actually can be perverse in the short term. The trade balance may actually get worse, the deficit may increase in the initial time period after a depreciation. So we show this just using a nice little schematic diagram. You start with a position of trade deficit, you go down to a lower point, the deficit's got bigger. And then hopefully, if the elasticities start to work through, the trade balance starts to improve in net terms. You end up in a better place than you had at the start. And this is called the J curve idea. The reason for the downward sloping bit is essentially that uh, businesses are committed to buying a given quantity of imports. Uh, they might be buying 50,000 tons of copper or a million barrels of oil. But when the exchange rate depreciates, those imports suddenly immediately become more expensive. But you're committed to the same volume of purchases, you just got to pay a higher price. It takes time for imports to respond. And equally, on the export side, the, the low exchange rate should be good news for American car producers trying to sell in China. But it takes time for those exports to respond to the exchange rate change and to start to feed through into, into higher sales. So that's probably the best way to draw the J curve. Um, I have seen some amazing examples of the J curve in exams and uh, quite a few people draw it uh, this way. And um, okay, I admit that looks a little bit more like a J to me. Uh, I, would, I would caution, uh, caution here. Extract two is about the structural trade deficit of the United States. And the idea that a fall in the currency of 10% um, can actually cause America to move from structural deficit to you know, very healthy surplus is clearly a myth, okay? Oh, by the way, a myth is a female moth. It's a myth. So I would avoid you, I would avoid drawing the J curve this way. I think it's probably better to draw the J curve diagram this way, showing hopefully the improvement in the trade position rather than drawing it this way, which shows an amazing, incredible improvement in the trade balance. The evaluation point here is that the exchange rate on its own is not enough. It's not enough to move a country from structural deficit to surplus. Of course, some students go the extra mile and decide to put in a line at the top, and then that makes their J curve and their life complete. Now, linked to the J curve, is the idea of the Marshall learner condition. So if you're going to use the J curve in your OCR 585 answer in, a, in the exam this summer, you need to be bringing into the analysis and into the discussion, 
the Marshall Learner Condition. You don't have to prove it in the exam. All you have to know is what the condition states. And it's this, a depreciation of the exchange rate will eventually lead to a net improvement in your trade position, provided that the sum of the coefficients of elasticity of demand for exports and imports are greater than one. The sum of PD for exports plus PD for imports is greater than one. If that condition holds, then a depreciation will improve the trade balance. Here are three examples of how you might want to show this in an, in an answer. Country A here has very low elasticities. The elasticity for exports is 0.4, even lower elasticity for imports. Add them together, it's less than 1, 0.7. Will the fall in the currency improve the trade balance? No, in fact, it probably will make it worse. Country B has a, an elastic demand for exports, price sensitive consumers perhaps. Pretty, pretty good elasticity for imports, 0.7. Add them together, 1.9, it's more than one. Uh, over time, a depreciation will improve the, the trade balance. Country C, uh, 0.8 elasticity for exports, but very low price elasticity for imports, 0.2. Add them together, just equals one. On balance, other things being the same, a depreciation of the exchange rate will leave the trade balance unchanged. So in the exam, please, if you're going to use the J curve, please also use the Marshall Learner Condition. Okay, so back to figure 2.1, which is an important figure, and uh, we don't want to wash over it too quickly because we, we think this is going to be quite important. It shows that China's current account surplus is falling. The American current account deficit is declining. So there is a squeezing of the imbalance. However, changes in, in its effective exchange rate did not always have the expected impact on the USA's current account deficit. I think that's a really important phrase in the extract. So why not? Why has the current account in the United States remained so large? Uh, as you show GDP about 2%, but hundreds of billions of dollars if you, if you measure it in, in dollar terms. Okay, well, I think essentially there are half a dozen reasons uh, why that's been the case. So just to reiterate, the scale of the depreciation in the dollar is actually being quite small in percentage terms. And that takes you back to figure 2.2. One reason for this, is that the United States is actually the world's reserve currency. So people see the dollar as a safe haven for their money. And indeed the extract figure two talks about inflows of money coming in from developing countries, surplus savings. So the dollar as a safe haven currency hasn't fallen as much as it might have done if you were to only consider the American trade balance. Second point, is goes back to what we've just been talking about in terms of the J curve. It could be the case that the elasticities of demand in the United States are pretty low, both for exports and imports. And as a result, you get a J curve effect. Third point is if the dollar falls, good news if you're trying to export products out of the States, but actually a lot of American companies have to import materials, components, capital equipment and what have you. And in a world of complex supply chains, vertical specialization, which we touched on in extract one, in that kind of world, a falling dollar actually adds to the cost of exporters and can squeeze their competitiveness. Point four is really quite important. Uh, what we've seen happen post 2008, post 2009, is there's been a significant rise in global savings, which have to find a home somewhere, many of which come from China and other, other emerging market countries. So we've seen a, a surge of money coming into the United States on the capital account, on a financial account. And that's been earning interest in dollars and earning profits from shares and what have you, and dividend payments. And so that's taken money back out of the American economy on the current account. Fifth point actually is the American economy as, as a whole is not particularly open. Uh, extract one gave us some data on trade to GDP ratios. And America's openness ratio is actually really low. 
it's less than 30 percent so it's a key evaluation point that changes in the u.s dollar because trade as a share of gdp is quite low those changes in the exchange rate have a less significant effect on the u.s trade balance point six refers to the timing issue that we mentioned a few minutes ago so the dollar was depreciating 2009 10 11 but at the same time the world economy was still suffering from the hangover from the global financial crisis the european union for example was falling back into deep recession so although the dollar was more competitive many of america's leading markets were, were struggling at the same time and point seven is just fundamental to understanding both extract two and also extract five when we get on to look at zambia as a developing country the dollar has fallen as an exchange rate that should help the trade balance but actually what really drives competitiveness what fundamentally drives the current account position is your supply side performance your investment your productivity your non-price competitiveness and you could argue that that in in the long run is way more important than a 10 percent fall in the us dollar extract two does encourage us to revise the balance of payments i just want to spend a few minutes in this revision webinar with you just making sure you're clear on the various parts of the balance of payments accounts because a2 as opposed to as you need to have that little extra depth of knowledge and detail so this slide will stay up for a minute or two as i take you through the, the basic balance of payments so we talked so far in extract two about the current account which is made up of four balances the balance of trading goods balance of trading services then what's called the net balance in primary income that's things like dividend payments and profits from overseas investments which might flow across borders and crucially it includes migrant remittances and migrant remittances are an absolutely essential part of extract four which we'll look at in a future revision session uh, the current account also includes what's called secondary income so in the uk context that includes the uh, overseas aid that we that we contribute at the moment at the moment quite controversial it includes our annual payments to the european union it includes our military spending commitment services so add all those together add one two three and four together we get the current account balance which is essentially also known as the external balance and we know that china runs a current account surplus and america runs a current account deficit now for a2 it's important to understand that there's also a financial account as well there's one or two capital account items which don't really matter that much but what really matters is that as we go two-thirds of the way down this slide if you look at the financial account so there are in the world economy big flows of capital across borders so huge amounts of fdi moving between countries uh, lots of money moving across uh, bank accounts in terms of debt payments debt purchases people buying and selling shares investors buying and selling property we call that portfolio investment the portfolio investment and we also know there's big swings of banking flows the so-called hot money moving in and out of different countries looking for the best rate of return on capital so what's the key takeaway point from this slide the current account basically measures whether a country is paying its way internationally the financial account is a way of balancing the books and this is the really important point coming up if a country has a current account deficit for example the united states or the uk and it needs to attract inflows of capital on a financial account to balance the, the overall balance of payments countries like the united states and the uk are deficit countries on the current account they have to attract inflows of finance fdi portfolio flows hot money etc to balance things up on the other hand countries such as china and other surplus countries well they have a surplus on the current account and that allows them to invest their surplus savings overseas include for example in foreign direct investment and in buying treasury debts in the united states and buying property in manhattan so that's the key to this extract 
Countries with current account surpluses have effectively surplus savings and dollar reserves, which they can then invest around the world economy. There's the balance of payments, just in a, a nice easy slide if you want to print that off for your revision notes. Now, China, we know, is a current account surplus country. And this has allowed China to build up enormous, absolutely ginormous foreign exchange reserves. By some estimates, even though it's fallen in the last year or so, China still has well over three trillion dollars of foreign exchange reserves. Most of which, this is measured in dollars, but most of which are in dollar assets. Now they're earning millions of dollars of interest every single day from this money. And of course it's allowed them, for example, to set up two of the world's biggest sovereign wealth funds to invest some of their surplus money. This is indeed a feature of extract two. Notice on the left hand side here what the extract says. The other part of the picture of global imbalances is reflected in international financial flows from developing to developed countries. Savings from poor countries have flooded into the United States seeking returns in US bonds and the housing market. And my flow chart tries to explain this. So countries with a surplus basically have an excess level of savings. Those savings have to find a home somewhere. They look for the highest rate of return adjusted for risk. The US dollar in the United States is seen as a safe haven currency and uh, bond prices have been going up because of quantitative easing. Share prices have been rising and so too have property prices in, in New York. So there's been a wall of money coming in from developing countries into the United States, which has driven up house prices once more and attracted even further capital inflows. And of course, from the United States point of view, that is a financial inflow that helps to cover their, their current account. It basically pays, pays for their current account deficit. This table, just to put some context into extract two, shows the latest figures for countries which run the biggest current account surpluses in the world. So extract two focuses on China, and that's fair enough, it's a huge economy. But actually China's current account surplus as a share of their GDP is, is really quite small compared with the countries in this table. I mean, the figures for Singapore and Taiwan and Holland are quite staggering. Any country which runs a surplus of more than 10% of GDP is in a different league to most other nations. I've picked out Germany, one of the world's biggest surplus countries, uh, the very rich advanced nation, the Europe's biggest economy. And I've also picked out their South Korea, very successful manufacturing country, globally scaled businesses, producing some superb products and very export dependent, um, running big surpluses there. Now, why, why are these countries running current account surpluses? I think in the exam, it's important to make a distinction between a structural cause, which is basically on the supply side, and a cyclical cause, which is essentially driven by changes in the economic cycle of one country or the world as a whole. So why is it, for example, that South Korea and Germany and China and Singapore are running big structural surpluses on their trade? The first reason is because they're nations of savers. They, they save a lot more than they invest. So they're not necessarily spending as much on imports as perhaps they might. Second structural reason, is that these countries have built and established huge globally scale businesses with brand names that you recognize around the world. And they've achieved economies of scale. They've built a, a huge significant competitive advantage in lots of different industries. Just think in the German case about Volkswagen and Adidas and Alliance Chemical. In South Korea, think about LG and Hyundai and Samsung. Another reason why countries might be running surpluses is because they're exporters of things like oil and gas and wood and copper and there's been a significant long-run structural increase in the price of those exports. It could also be the case that they've made good investments overseas over the long term and those profits and those dividends have come back in to help their balance of payments. And another cause could be that they've just raised their game in terms of lifting their capital and labour productivity, which has brought down their unit labour costs and given them more of a comparative advantage in their key markets. 
So substitutes aside, which of these is most important for a particular country? But by and large, when you look at surplus nations, pretty much they have long run good structural fundamentals, which help them. And it could also be the case they're helped by cyclical factors. Maybe their exchange rate has become more competitive by falling. Uh, it could be the case that their main export markets are seeing a recovery in demand. Consumers want to buy more products from, from them. It could be that the terms of trade have moved in their favor. And that's a particularly important aspect of extract three which we'll come to in a future session. It could be that the nation's an importer of oil and gas and the world price has fallen. That helps their balance of payments. And from extract, port, extract four point of view, it could be the case that a nation is now a major recipient of remittance incomes from people living and working overseas. Again, that would help their balance of payments. So why does it matter if a country runs a current account surplus? What is the significance of these trade imbalances that extract two is, is pointing us towards? Well, for the, from the point of view of the surplus countries, if you're running a, a positive on your trade balance, it's going to be adding to GDP because X is greater than M, and that should be a positive for your growth rate. However, it could, in theory, lead to some demand poor inflationary pressure because excess demand. We've mentioned how surplus countries can accumulate huge foreign exchange reserves, particularly in the case of China, and countries such as Norway and Singapore. But equally, if you're running a current account surplus, although you're accumulating lots of dollar reserves, there could be pressure on the exchange rate to appreciate, which could cause some damage to other parts of your economy. The really key point is that if you're running a current account surplus, it allows you on the financial account to be a net exporter of capital. It allows you to invest money overseas, to balance the books up. The other aspect, of course, is that these trade imbalances can trigger protectionism. So here's a way of linking extract two with extract one, which talks about the threat of tariff and non-tariff protectionism in the world economy. Germany and China are often picked out as two of the big surplus countries in the world. Germany's current account surplus, actually in dollar terms, is much bigger than China, both in dollars and also as a share of GDP. And one of the criticisms of the German current account surplus is it's basically the result of the German economy saving too much at a national level, German consumers and German businesses. So it's, it's argued that Germany is saving a lot. And if Germany could spend more on the products of other European countries, then the European Union might not be in the, in the doldrums and in the problems that it's facing at the moment. So the argument is that German surplus savings actually depress demand in countries like Spain, and Italy and Greece. And therefore, those countries end up with higher unemployment and also with the risk of deflation. And that's quite a good point to make because the, the decisions about German savers working through the balance of payments can actually affect the rate of unemployment in parts of Spain, for example. It shows the interconnected nature of economies. What about the point of view of uh, China? Well, the counter argument is that if you're running a current account surplus, that allows you to run a capital account deficit. So essentially, that gives you the money to export investment to other countries. And we've seen numerous examples of Chinese investment in sub-Saharan Africa, including in extract five countries, Zambia. So you could argue that the Chinese current account surplus ultimately helps to pay for better roads, better rail links, new airports, new schools and hospitals in some of the poorest countries in the world. Hopefully you can see here that there are countervailing arguments on both sides of the equation. What about our current account deficit countries? The United States is clearly one of them. Britain also has a big current account deficit of more than 5% of GDP. Again, make a distinction between structural and cyclical causes. On the supply side, Deficit countries tend to underinvest. They tend to have relatively low labor productivity. Perhaps they've lost control of inflation, allowed it to rise too quickly relative to other countries. Oftentimes they don't spend enough on research and development, on innovation, so they're a little bit behind the curve when it comes to dynamic efficiency. And they've basically just struggled on the supply side to adjust to a world of much more intensive low cost competition. 
So oftentimes a current account deficit can be the result of, of genuinely important supply side weaknesses. And on the cyclical side, perhaps their exchange rate is a touch overvalued. Uh, perhaps consumers have been borrowing and spending more than they would normally do. And that's been sucking in imports. Perhaps one of your major export markets has gone into, a, into an economic slump affecting your sales. And crucially, from the point of view of Zambia, which will come to an extract five, perhaps you're highly dependent on just one or two primary products and the world price of your major export collapses, causing the terms of trade to deteriorate and causing your balance of payments to go, to go south as well. Equally, it could be the case of the country's running a bigger deficit because it's actually importing the things it needs to grow. For example, new capital technology and infrastructure equipment. So why does a deficit matter? What's the significance of countries running deficits? Well, X is less than M. So in a deficit country, there's gonna be a fall in demand from the circular flow. Countries with, which run deficits will grow less quickly. Uh, you can bring in the uh, stuff from last year on multiply effects. So if export industries lose jobs, that has consequences for employment and spending in supply chain industries and the regional economies. Countries, particularly developing nations who run big deficits, often find that their foreign exchange reserves collapse. They essentially run out of dollars and they can run into deep financial crises uh, quite quickly, which can require, for example, emergency loans and finance from, from the IMF or from countries such as China. And crucially, if a country is running a current account deficit, then that can lead to exchange rate weakness. So typically what you find that a deficit country sees their currency fall, that should help exports, but actually there's negative downsides, it increases inflation, imported food becomes more expensive, imported energy becomes more expensive, and so therefore real living standards take a hit. And a weak exchange rate actually causes investors to become nervous. So for example, governments may have to spend more interest on, on any debt that they issue. So current account deficits are often a sign of economic weakness, but can create problems in their wake. The key question really is whether a current account deficit can actually be, can it, can it be financed? Is a country in sufficiently good state? Is it sufficiently stable economically and politically? Does it have enough attractive investments to bring in the portfolio money, to bring in the hot money, to bring in the FDI? And that is certainly a topic we'll return to in some detail when we come to look at Zambia in extract five. So this revision session has looked at the balance of payments. This is the, the key aspect of extract two. In particular, we've made a distinction between the current account and the financial account. And we've looked at the whole issue of the Chinese US trade imbalance and whether or not a change in the exchange rate on its own is sufficient to restore some of the imbalances that we see between some of the big countries in the world. Hopefully you found this useful. Please go through the presentation again at your leisure if you have a few moments later on or stream us on the web. Uh, we're very happy to keep the conversation flowing uh, on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at cheetah to you, Jeff. Loads of new, more, new resources on this uh, exam, more generally on our website, uh, tutor to you.net forward slash economics. Look forward to uh, meeting up again and uh, doing some more work on this uh, important exam in uh, future sessions. So for now, thank you for joining in and uh, take care and uh, we'll see you soon.